Unreal Engine. I have been keeping my eye on this engine for a couple of years now. As you probably know, since the popularity of Fortnite and the boatload of cash they were making with it, they've opened their own digital game store and started giving away games. But what you might not know is that they also have an asset marketplace. Kind of like how Unity has their own asset store. And they started giving away free assets every single month. When I found out about this, I was not using Unreal, but my inner hoarder told me to definitely make an account and start collecting those assets. It's safe to say that over the last couple of years I've hoarded quite a few assets and then they do the impossible. They announce Unreal Engine 5 and all of its power, with Nanite and Lumen set to change the game development industry forever. Now I have both my eyes on the engine. So I decided to start learning Unreal Engine. I kind of know how to make games already so I started watching some tutorials, not really following them step by step like I used to do when I was learning Unity, mostly just watching and absorbing knowledge, knowledge of how how the systems in Unreal work together. Spoiler, it's not the same as Unity. After like three months of watching tutorials and courses, I decided to start my Unreal Engine adventure with a small project. So the idea I had for the game was of a haunted house cleaning simulator. Heavily inspired by the need to clean of Power Wash Simulator and the type of spooks of the Mortuary Assistant. Secrets. Hi! I was like, I don't remember having a mannequin here before. <laughs> Basically, you would go around the house mopping the floor in a not so satisfying way as Power Wash Simulator and also pick up trash from the ground and put it in bins while being spooked by a monster in a game with really cool Unreal Engine next-gen graphics. A pretty simple premise and a pretty simple idea for a first game. Or so I thought. Now, I know I just mentioned Unreal Engine 5 and all of its super cool and shiny new tech, but when I decided to make this game, Unreal Engine 5 was still in early access. Which means it was prone to have some bugs. And the last thing I wanted was to get stuck on a bug or have something not work properly in my game and not being able to understand if it was something I was doing wrong or if it was a problem of the engine. So for that reason, I decided to use Unreal Engine 4. Aside from the new technology and the new read design, from what I've seen, both Unreal Engine 4 and 5 seem to work exactly the same way, so if I know how to work in Unreal Engine 4, I can easily transfer that KNOWLEDGE into Unreal Engine 5. Also, side note, from the moment I decided to make this game and the moment of recording this, Unreal Engine 5 went from early access to preview to now finally out. So just side note, Unreal Engine 5 it's not on early access anymore. Okay, moving on. Now the first thing I did was, of course, look for assets, and I had a plethora of them to pick and choose from. Now I didn't want this game to feel like an asset flip, so I grabbed a modular house pack, that way I can layer the level as I want it and have total control of the flow of the game. I also grabbed a mop from the supermarket asset pack and some trash from Megascans. This was enough for me to start building this prototype and getting the mechanics down. Now in Unreal Engine you can either use C++, which from what I've heard is the equivalent of HELL, or you can use Blueprints, which is Unreal Engine's visual scripting, where you can connect different nodes together to create the logic of the game. Now, do not get fooled, okay? This is programming. The only difference is that it's in a visual form. The same steps you would need to write in traditional code need to be in here for it to work. And the visual component of it, to me at least, is very appealing. I'm more of a visual person. I have eyeballs and I like colors, so I definitely prefer this over written code. Although blueprints can end up looking very messy and confusing if you don't organize it properly. So I started by modifying Unreal's basic first-person shooter template, created an interactables interface and started setting up the interactable UI so that when you look at something that you can interact with, a little text pops up saying what you can do with this object, like cleaning it or picking it up. For the interactables, I started with the mopping functionality, so I slapped the mop into the player and this is when I started missing Unity. In Unity, you can create animations in side of Unity, which means you don't need to rely on other software. That helped me a lot, for instance, in the Damien game, to make the animations of the monster and the axe. The only animation I needed to start was the mopping animation, but in Unreal, you 
can't really do that, as far as I know. In Unreal, you can create sequences, which are used for cutscenes, but not so much to create one-off animations that can be reused later, like the axe animation in Damien. So this is where the brain really needed to start wrinkling so that I could find a different way to do this. So what I did was, I moved the object inside of my player using blueprints. It's a bit messy, but what I did was I had two different positions for the mob to be in and I just make it move back and forth between those two positions. And if you angle the player just right, you can make it look like you're mopping the air. You're a wizard, Harry. It can look a bit jank, but it works. And we know the saying, as, as long, long as, as it works, works that's, that's what, what matters. 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 Exactly. So the next step was to create the grabbing of objects and placing them in the bin. But then I decided it was a good idea to do some live streaming. Look at the graphics, wow! So I did a member live stream and I was like, should I implement the picking up of objects or should I do some level design? And everyone was like, oh, level design! design! So yeah, I, I did that first. I had made a quick sketch of the layout of the house, so I grabbed the modular pieces and started putting the house together. Things are starting to look like things. At this point, I realized that even using modular assets has its own learning curve, especially when you want things to line up properly, but the measurements hate you. Ah, oh, no. What? Doesn't fit. Is, is my math wrong? If this is 400. It says here, floor 400. This is one. This is one. And this is two. Is, unless that's not what it means. Something is wrong with the math in here, right? I thought my book writing was slow. <laughs> hey, you guys wanted level design, you asked for this! <laughs> this was followed by another hour and a half of me stressing and trying to build just the walls of the house. Perfect. One, two, the 200. Oh! <gasps> See, I knew this math was wrong. This is not a hundred. This is the problem. I don't know who worked on the math on these houses, but uh, they need the opposite of a raise. However, I did end up finishing it during the live stream, but some of the doors weren't aligned exactly as I wanted. Oh God, my OCD is not gonna like this, but it worked. Fantastic. Okay, one part's done. After that, it was time for the other interactables. So I made trash that you could pick up, the trash cans that you could use to throw away the trash in your hands, the doors, and keys. I used a bunch of decals for the stains on the ground, and I used some assets of the underground subway for the trash. Now this game might look simple, and it is, but there are a lot of moving pieces here, and all of them need to work nicely together. So because I was using an interface, I had to use an interface switch to make each interaction different. So interacting with the stains on the ground would do one thing, interacting with the trash would do another, etc, etc. And I had to make sure they wouldn't collide with each other. So you can only mop if you don't have trash in your hand. And you can't pick up trash if you already have trash in your hand. And of course the UI had to show the right text when looking at these different interactables. And I actually ended up making a different type of interactable for the door because it was not playing nicely with the UI and I was starting to lose my mind. You know, normal programming things that happen. This was the bulk of the programming, just making all these interactions work properly. But once that was completed, it was time to furnish the house. Now, Unreal Engine projects tend to get real big real fast. A blank project with almost nothing in it can have easily 200 to 300 megabytes. So instead of loading all of the asset packs I wanted into this project, I had a side project called Asset Dump, where I would load all of the the asset packs that I would need and then I would pick and choose from the ones I wanted and just export them to the main project. So that's what I did. I went to my asset dump project and started picking objects to populate the house. Now the problem with using different asset packs is that sometimes assets don't really work well together and sometimes an asset might look good but have a different color than the one you want. For instance, I really liked this toilet from the Edith Finch assets but it's pink and I wanted a white color toilet, so I can't use it, right? WRONG! Thankfully, the asset was split into three different shaders, so all I had to do was choose a different colored shader for it. Easy! 
others, like the beds, I didn't have that option, so I didn't even bother changing it. But you could absolutely grab the texture and paint something else. I, I'm just too lazy. I also avoided branded assets, especially from the Edith Finch collection. Some of these assets are very lore specific to that game and would make no sense in mine. You can also modify the shaders themselves. For instance, I really like the fluffy material in one of the rugs, so I grabbed that material and used it in the entire master bedroom. Again, changing the material to make it look different and the stains just looked so cool in them. <laughs> like they were actually actually ingrained in the fluffy carpet. And so that's what I did for like three hours. I just kept filling out the different rooms until the entire house felt like a home. After everything was furnished, the nightmare started. Light baking, the bane of everyone's time. Now, I, I really don't want to go into a lot of detail of how light baking works, but basically, if you turn on a light in a room, the light will hit the ground and bounce off to the walls, illuminating the whole room. It's not like you can only see where the light hits, right? Except that's exactly how light works in video games. To make the lighting more realistic and bounce all over the place, you have to do something called light bake. This requires a lot of time and a lot of processing power. Unreal also has a lot of different quality levels for your light bakes, but in general, the better the quality and the bigger your level is, the longer it will take to bake. Big levels can take literally hours to bake all the lights. Now, this was not a big problem to me because this level is actually quite small, except for the fact that I used modular pieces and for some reason, the light bouncing off of the modular pieces makes them very, very noticeable. Again, I, I really don't want to go into a lot of detail, but this problem was only fixed almost at the end of the project when I decided to try something called asset merging. I would merge the assets together and only then would Unreal treat the different modular pieces as one big piece and then I didn't have that problem anymore. But trust me, I spent more time trying to fix this issue than almost anything else in the game. But that issue aside, and because the player doesn't carry a flashlight, I tried making the game well lit enough for the player to see the stains and the trash on the ground, but also make it dark enough to keep the creepiness and the ambiance on high level. Another thing I did was to add a tasks list. I needed to make sure that once the entire room was clean, that the player would be notified so that they wouldn't go around making sure they didn't miss anything. You know, little quality of life things. So I needed to make sure of how many trash and stains were on each room. And every time you would clean or throw one of the trashes away, remove Move one from that amount. And when it was equal to zero, that meant the entire room was cleaned. It looks kind of strange in the blueprints, but it was surprisingly easy to implement. Now, it's not a real game without a tutorial. I personally don't think that this game is that complicated that it would need a tutorial, but as a game designer, it's good practice to assume that anyone can play your game and it might not be super obvious what the goal is. What are you doing? I just want a chance. That's a thing I can do. So I ended up making the entrance bigger just so I could lay out a tutorial and explain exactly everything you will do in this game. This is when I started messing with the level blueprints, trigger invisible walls, and having scripts communicate with each other, which was something I found was way easier in Unreal than it was in Unity. I also made some UI text popping up in the corner, very Damien-like, telling you exactly what to do, which I will admit was harder than I thought it would be. I, I should know how this works yet. Confuzzled is my name. I basically tried pacing this tutorial where the player would go through each step of the game, learning how to mop, how to throw things in the trash, and how to check your list to know when your job is completed. I didn't mention this before, but getting the task list's check mark to work properly made my blood pressure spike to uncontrollable levels. Uh, no, no, and I'm gonna do this, uh, and then when I open... God! <laughs> Why? Oh no! But in the end it worked. Thank god. Cue the We Are The Champions song. <laughs> now, for a haunted house cleaning simulator, there was a lot of cleaning in this house, but not a lot of haunting going on. So it was time to add the monster. This was the only asset in this game that was not from the marketplace. Do you remember Fisher? You know, Fisher, he made that really cool art for Do It For Me, and he made the really cool drawings for the final cutscene of the worst stash clicker. And yes, I will do a video on that game, but do you remember Fisher? So we had a little chat, and I told him I wanted to start learning Unreal, and I was like, how are your 3D skills? To which he replied, 
non-existing. So I grabbed a couple of Blender courses and threw them at him and said, LEARN IT! And he, like a champ from a very small, very poorly detailed sketch I made, created this creepy looking thing. Like I mentioned, you can't animate in Unreal. As far as I know. So I couldn't do anything fancy with it, but I could create poses for the monster, which was all I needed for this game. Now I wish I could tell you that I, I grabbed the monster and I started posing it with no issues, but I would be lying. Fisher sent me the Blender file, so I was trying to figure out if I exported it wrong from Blender and testing all of the different buttons in Unreal while importing it. Nothing worked. I mean, look at all these settings. Why are there so many settings? And strangely, this was only happening with the arms. Nothing else was broken. So I, I talked to Fisher and we even watched a tutorial by Pontypans on how to import models from Blender to Unreal, very specific, and still nothing worked. And then Fisher was just like, look, I'll just redo the bones and hopefully that'll work. By the end of that day, he sent me the model with the new bones following Mr. Pontypans tutorial, just like magic. And also this. I'll leave Mr. Pontypen's tutorial link in the description. So, now it was just a matter of putting the monster in spooky places, looking at the player when they least expect. This was also very code intensive, because now it's all about programming different events for different parts of the game. Like setting triggers to only trigger when a certain event happens or after the player picks up a specific item. And of course, it's not a horror game until it has sound. Now, sound and atmosphere are like, what, 80% of what you need to make a horror game work? 90% maybe? For this game, I didn't rely on music, just on atmosphere sounds and the sounds of your actions. Like mopping or picking up objects. Very simple stuff. <laughs> or so I thought. Turns out that leaving the audio for the end might not be a good idea, because now you have to dig into your code to shove the audio in, and in some cases it might not even work. For instance, for picking up objects, I wanted to have a different sound for each type of trash, but the way they were programmed did not have support for different sound effects, so I had to create extra code for it to work properly. So word of advice, maybe don't leave the audio for the end. Still in the sound department, there was something that Unreal has that Unity doesn't, and this was one of the things where I didn't miss Unity at all. Audio control. I'm not even talking about the fact that you can fade in sound with a single note, which in Unity has to be done through code, as far as I know. I'm talking about audio cues, which are like audio sources, but they can have code written in them. So for something like footsteps, you can drop three different sounds and have other notes control the randomness of what sound it plays, of its volume and its pitch. Which in Unity, you would need to program a system to do this, so I found it very convenient, especially for things like, well, footsteps and random little sounds. And at this point, the main game was basically done. I just needed to set up a main menu, a few options, and of course, the different endings. Is it really a Lixen game without multiple endings? For the menus, Unreal uses something called widgets, which I had to use for the interactables UI and the tasks, but this was the very first time I had to use buttons and menu interactions, which was actually quite easy to set up. For the cutscenes, they are basically all the same. A camera zooming in into a telephone, but each cutscene has a different audio recording of my definitely very excellent and very professional voice acting. I won't show it here, I will let to experience it. And the game is finally completed. Now I just need to build the game. Packaging failed? What does that mean? Unknown cook failure? Cook failed? I'll cook better! So here's something else you shouldn't do. Never work on your game for days, weeks, or even months on end without ever trying to make a build. And that goes for every game engine you use. After many hours, and I mean many hours, trying to figure out why that was happening, it turns out the problem was a few blueprints from the modular house were using a specific plugin from Unreal that was not turned on in my project. The thing is, I wasn't even using them in my project, but Unreal was treating them as if they were. So after I deleted them, it built fine, thank god. Now let me just make sure this isn't... 10 gig... what? Wh what? How? This game is so tiny! And there I go to YouTube, trying to figure out how I make the file size smaller. Turns out Unreal builds all the maps from the project, even the ones you're not using. And apparently, maps hold a lot of data. 
I had maps that were over one gigabyte in size. Fortunately, there's an option where you can tell exactly the only maps you want to include. Kind of like how Unity does it, but in this case, I do prefer the way Unity does it, by forcing you to choose the levels before you build. I also watched this tutorial, link in the description, that showed me something called Size Map, which is a very cool feature from Unreal that tells you how big are the files in a specific folder. So I started deleting assets I didn't use and compressing textures from 4K to 2K or even lower sometimes. And all of that ended up making a huge difference from 10 gigabytes to 883 megabytes. Much better, but in my opinion, still quite high for how small this game is. After all of that, I added the credits where I had to paste all of the members names and that's it. The game was done. And you can download it and play right now, link in the description. The game is free! Okay, it's free! Well, it's technically pay what you want, which if you do, I really appreciate it, but if you don't want to pay anything, just click the no thanks, just take me to downloads button. And thank you for playing my game. In hindsight, I do feel like the game doesn't look very next-gen. I mean, it looks okay, and I was definitely using decent assets, but it just shows that even making things look photorealistic or even just decent, it takes skill, practice, and knowledge. But this was my first Unreal game, so I'm not too worried about that just yet. I'm just glad I finished the game. Unreal is a beast of its own. Programming wise, although I'm using visual scripting, the order of the game logic is pretty much the same as Unity's. But the way Unreal works, with its game modes and pawns and player characters, it's very, very different. I definitely learned a lot of how the underlying systems of Unreal work, but there is so, but so much to explore here. But hey, one step at a time. A special thanks to all the members of the channel who made this possible and put up with me and my dumbness making games. This is one game out of three. Finally, finally making some progress. And thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care.